We remain on our feet as we take our congregational song, Gospel Hymns and Song number 25. Gospel Hymns and Song number 25. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him, no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to him. Joy flows my soul, for Jesus has saved me, freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem me. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for all eternity.
Sunday message today, we shall have a brief period of scripture reading. The Acts of the Apostles The Acts of the Apostles Acts 18 Acts 18 After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul, and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names, and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat, and Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus, and left them there. But he himself entered into the synagogue, and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem, but I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Acts 19 And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed, and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together, and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them, and found it fifty thousand pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God, and prevailed. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. At the same time there arose no small stir about that way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath, and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another. For the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defense unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, ye ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For ye have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if ye inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. May God help us to be doers of the word. Amen.
Praise the Lord. That's cool. I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord be with us at the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for the Spirit of God. And thank you for the revelation you always give us whenever we come to the Bible study. We're praying that tonight you reveal your truth, your will, your word, and the proper interpretation of your word to every one of us in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding and give us the grace and the strength and the willingness and the loyalty and faithfulness to be obedient to your word, even as you teach us tonight in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Tonight we are coming back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And you remember in the last study from verse 1 all through to verse 11 that the Corinthian Christians, the believers, they had asked a question about marriage. And Paul the Apostle, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God, was going to give them an answer. And it turns out to be a very long chapter. That's chapter 7. The answer comes from verse 1 all through to verse 40. Please turn to your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says, Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. He said, You've written about marriage, about a man and a woman coming together in holy matrimony. He said, I would have told you actually, it is good for a man to remain single and for the woman to remain single. But then he remembered the word of God that God had said at the beginning, it is not good that the man should be alone. And because of that, he quickly now says in verse 2, he tells us in verse 2, he says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. That's very important. We need to understand this because there are divergent views about marriage. You go to a seminary, you read a commentary, you listen to different preachers, and they say different things on the basis of some of the verses you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Why do they have so much difficulty interpreting the word of God? Number one, because of hardness of heart. That's exactly what Jesus said when the Pharisees asked the question and said, Is it lawful for a man to put up, to put away his wife for every cause? He gave them the answer. God has joined them together, whether they are believers or unbelievers, whether they are Pharisees or Sadducees or their disciples, the Lord joined them together. Why? Because it's the institution of God. And Jesus said what God has joined together, let no man put them asunder. Then they said, why then do we have the permission to put away the wife from the law of Moses? He said, number one, because of the hardness of your heart. When you come to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you're going to find the same thing. There are people that have hardness of heart, and because of their hardness of heart, they see only what they want to see and they interpret the word of God the way they want to interpret the word of God Jesus said number two the reason why there are divergent views about marriage and the teaching of the word of God as we have come to this chapter 7 is because of tradition it says you make the word of God the will of God the way of God of non-effect by your tradition 
there are people today that depend on the tradition of their denomination and because of that tradition they're not able to see it's like they're wearing the spectacles of a tradition and they only see what their tradition in their denomination had told them and then paul the apostle said in second second corinthians chapter 2 verse 17 it says we're not of them that corrupt the word of god number three there is the misinterpretation of the word of god people come to first corinthians chapter 7 they forget the standard of the word the foundation of the word and they forget the steadfastness of the word of god that god has given his word and that word is settled forever in heaven and then they misinterpret they misapply some of the verses you find in first corinthians chapter 7 there are people that deliberately will misinterpret the word of god as you come to first corinthians chapter 7 because of childlessness because there is no child in the union no child in the marriage then they find excuses they're just finding excuse to put away the wife so that they can marry another person they say i cannot just stay like that in marriage without having a child they forget people like uh, uh, Zechariah, uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth up to their old age they were still serving the Lord they were married and they have been married for many years and yet there was no child they came to the word of God what we're saying is that as you come to first Corinthians chapter 7 you need to actually pay attention to all the verses because there are people that depend on the hardness of heart no salvation no real experience with the lord and because of that they will misinterpret and misapply number two because of tradition number three because of misinterpretation number four because of childlessness then paul the apostle himself mentioned in first corinthians chapter 7 he says because of the present distress he says because of the present distress what would you consider getting married if you marry you have not seen but he said because of this present distress it will be better for you to remain as i but you know present distress is something temporal it's just like the present pandemic is something temporal and you cannot build doctrine and interpretation of the word of god on pandemic or on the present distress paul the apostle said in that same chapter he said i permit you can go and get married but you will have trouble in the flesh and there are people because of the challenges of marriage and because of the trouble in the flesh that is why they refuse to keep to the word of god and then of course because of persecution you see there are people that go through persecution in their families husband persecuting wife or wife persecuting husband or the in-laws persecuting and because of that persecution that may even be very very threatening to life they say i cannot go on anymore and then they find a way of escape out of their decision they're going to get away with them and do away with the marriage because of this intense persecution but the lord is telling us we need to come back to the word that's why as we come today to first corinthians chapter 7 we're reading and we're learning from verse 12 all through to verse 24 and he tells us the things that we ought to do and then you need to understand what's the real standard of the word of god the foundation of the word of god and abide in that foundation of the word of god please open your bible and we're looking at first corinthians chapter 7 and we're reading from verse 12 it says but to the rest speak i not the lord you see paul the apostle was very careful 
it says what the lord has spoken from genesis what the lord has spoken all through to malachi and what the lord has spoken all all through in matthew and what you will read in romans chapter 7 verses 2 and 3 and what you will read in ephesians chapter 5 from verse 22 all through verse 33 that's the word of the lord that is the standard that is the foundation on which you build the doctrine of marriage but then he says to the rest speak i not the lord if any brother has a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him let him not put her away and then he goes on to all the other verses we're looking at the word of god today the subject is the title is the steadfast perseverance of the members of christ were members of christ he had told us that in a chapter six shall i take the men, member of christ and then join it to an alert he says say god forbid don't you know that when those two are joined together they become one flesh but he that is joined to the lord is one spirit we are members of christ and we need to have perseverance and steadfast perseverance as members of christ on the doctrines of the word of god we're dividing the message to three parts number one enduring the difficulties in mixed marriages enduring the difficulties in mixed marriages number two establishing the distinctives for every man every man as you come into the kingdom as you come into the gospel there is the standard of the word of god and it is established we establish that on the foundation of the word of god number three is exemplifying the devotion of his members that is those who claim to belong to the lord you are members of christ members of the body of christ and a real child of god whatever the denomination and whenever you got converted in this age in this century or in past centuries there is the word of god and it is exemplified for us and we need to have devotion as members of his body by coming to point number one in point number one enduring the difficulties in mixed marriages please understand as you read from second corinthians chapter 6 reading from verse 14 it says be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers that means if you're a believer already if you're a child of god already you've come into the kingdom already you become a new creature in christ and you have not married as you are planning your marriage and as you're doing the will of god in marriage remember a believer is not to have any agreement any fellowship any uh, any covenant in marriage with an unbeliever be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers but you know we're talking about those who are married before they became born again before they became christians and they get into mix already now the man becomes converted after marriage but the wife is not converted yet or the woman becomes born again real child of god and the husband is not born again yet in that situation that's what is referred to as mixed marriage and now there'll be difficulties there there'll be challenges there because one one person believes and the other person does not believe in such in, in such a marriage what do you do you endure the difficulties in the mixed marriage it tells us in first corinthians reading from chapter 7 and it says from verse 12 but to the rest speak i not the lord if any brother has a wife that believeth not a brother a child of god he has a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him let him not put her away then in verse 13 and the woman which has an husband that believeth not the woman a believer 
that has an husband that believeth not and if he be pleased to dwell with her let her not leave him for this for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife sanctified what that means is set apart because at home the woman is a believer is uh, talking about Christ is singing about Christ is living for Christ that man is seeing the light of the gospel right there in front of him all the time anytime there's a, there's a problem in the family she takes it to the Lord in prayer and God answers a prayer that man is different from a total unbeliever outside who does not see any prayer answered who does not see the demonstration of salt and of light in the world who does not see the practical demonstration of the believer of the believing one in christ anywhere that's why it says the husband unbelieving husband is set apart is distinguished he has knowledge he has understanding he has revelation even though he's not born again yet is different from other men outside and then it says if he be pleased to dwell with her let her not leave him the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is set apart by the husband else were your children unclean but now they are holy what that means is not that the husband unbelieving husband is automatically born again or the unbelieving wife is automatically born again what he's saying is he has the privilege of being born again he has the privilege of coming in into the kingdom because he can see the kingdom life kingdom love and kingdom faith and kingdom assurance and kingdom authority demonstrated right there the same thing with the children those children are set apart although one uh, of the parents is uh, born again and one is not born again those children can compare they can compare the life of the one that is born again with the one that is not born again and the choice is before them i rather go the way of uh, my mom who is a born again believer i rather go the way of my dad who is a born again believer and i can see the difference that's the privilege of those children in that situation and that's why as you think about enduring the difficulties in mixed marriages uh, there are three things number one god's authoritative command to believers in mixed marriages god's authoritative command to believers in mixed marriages number two great apostolic caution for believers in uh, um, in mixed marriages the apostle cautioning uh, the people admonishing the people and saying yes your condition is like this and this is where you find yourself but all the same uh, understand you might be the means of getting your husband saved you might be the means of getting your wife saved and then your life too can draw your children uh, unto the lord the third part there is godly ascending consecration of believers in mixed marriages let's look at number one first corinthians chapter 7 verses 12 and 13 we've read those verses already let's look at romans chapter 7 in romans chapter 7 we're reading from verses 2 and 3 romans chapter 7 verses 2 and 3 the woman which has an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth but if the husband be dead she is loose from the law of her husband and that is the standard of the word of god you see over here paul the apostle is writing to the believers at rome and the romans were gentiles and he was writing to them the same thing the corinthians were gentiles and he says this is the authoritative word of god 
the husband and the wife are bound together by the law of God until they do them part. Then he tells us in verse 3, So then, so then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress, gentle, Jew, Christian, you become a Christian, a born again believer now. While your husband is alive, you are bound by the word of God, by the law of God unto your husband. While your wife is alive, you are bound by the law of God, by the institution of God. You are bound unto that wife until death do you part. If while the husband is alive, you leave that family, and you go to marry another person, you'll be called an adulteress. If while your wife is still alive, you throw her away and marry another one, you'll be called an adulterer. But if her husband be dead, she's free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man you can see then the word of god telling us that marriage is permanent the marriage of husband and wife of man and woman in the sight of god remains untouchable remains unbreakable until death do them part in malachi chapter 2 reading from verse 14 malachi chapter 2 reading from verse 14 yet she say wherefore because the lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth the wife of the youth that the wife the woman you first got married to and the lord has been witness understand that the people the jews at this time they were not really standing believers because if you read from chapter 1 you will see how the Lord said if I'm your father where is my honor if you read from chapter 2 you will see from uh, the description of their lives there they were not abiding in the Lord if you come to chapter 3 you will see he said this whole nation you have robbed me but understand that even though the Lord had controversy with them as to their stand in righteousness, as to their stand in holiness, when it comes to marriage, it says your marriage is still recognized because it is the institution of God. So somebody cannot misinterpret the Bible and say, after all, I wasn't a believer when I married her and I wasn't a standing Christian when I married him, I backslid, and it was because of the backsliding you know, that I married him or married her. Once you are married, the Lord recognizes that marriage. Look at this in verse 15 now, and he says, did he not make one yet? And he the residue of spirit, wherefore, and, and wherefore one that he might seek a godly seed therefore take it to your to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth look at verse 16 for the lord the god of israel says he hateth putting away hateth in the continuous things not just that he hated it in the past he will hate it in the future when the church is born but all through the time every time all the centuries all the ages all the dispensations from generation to generation he hated divorce he hated putting away but one covers him won't cover it violence with his garment says the lord of hosts therefore take heed to your spirit that none deal treacherously that ye do not deal treacherously look at psalm 119 in psalm 119 reading from verse 89 
119 verses, verse 89, forever, O Lord, thy watch is settled in heaven. Every watch of God, every doctrine of the Bible, whether their people have hardness of heart or they have tradition or maybe because of their misrepresentation or misinterpretation or maybe because of a problem of childlessness or because of the present distress or because of trouble in the flesh or because of persistent intense persecution that watch of God concerning marriage and concerning any other doctrine any other teaching is settled forever in heaven please understand that when you're having challenges please understand that when people come for counseling look at the uh, problem i have look at the challenges we have at home what should i do don't sympathize to the point that you change the word of god forever oh lord thy word is settled in heaven thy faithfulness is unto all generations thou hast established the earth and it abideth now the caution the, the great apostolic caution for believers in mixed marriages we're coming to first corinthians chapter 7 in first corinthians chapter 7 a verses 14 and 15 this is where paul the apostle reminded the people he says don't hurry out of the marriage even though there are challenges even though there are difficulties don't say i'm packing it up do you know whether you'll be an instrument of salvation to that unbelieving man an instrument of salvation to that unbelieving woman and then your children consider your children the privilege they have because you are a child of god because you are born again and you can pass the light of the gospel unto those children that's why he cautioned them as you read your bible in the old testament in exodus chapter 4 you remember when Moses Moses was coming to answer the call of God and the wife was coming away uh, with him and then we're told in that passage uh, that's in Exodus chapter 4 verses, uh, verses 19 uh, all through 26 that the Lord wanted to kill the child because the child was not circumcised and then the wife took a sharp stone and circumcised the child and then called Moses a bloody husband because before that time Moses had wanted to circumcise the child and the woman did not understand because the woman was not from Israel was not a Jewess and said no the child will not be circumcised now when the Lord was to visit judgment upon that child that any one of the descendants of Abraham that is not circumcised will be cut off from Israel then the woman now saw it was a dangerous sin for the boy not to be circumcised and but now it, she called the uh, husband a bloody husband that means a husband of bloods because a uh, circumcision brought a uh, blood will make uh, the child to bleed but you understand uh, uh, that even though temporarily they were separated because of the assignment moses had in egypt when they had come away from egypt just through the father of the wife brought the wife back onto the husband so you will understand even though it was like a mixed marriage but the man of god moses stayed and abode in that in that marriage because that is the will of god in first corinthians chapter 7 reading from verses 10 and 11 first corinthians chapter 7 reading from verse 10 it says and unto the marriage i command yet not i but the lord you see the carefulness of paul the apostle when he was going to say something you know, that god had not said that had not been revealed unto him that he could not say thus says the lord he revealed to them he said 
I give my opinion. I give my idea. I give my counsel. He said, I speak, but not the Lord. But when he was going to say something you know, that is established, that is unchangeable, that is immutable, that is unshakable, now he says in verse 10 unto the marriage I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. And then it says, but, and if she depart, let her remain on marriage or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife then now we look at number three there godly ascending consecration of believers he makes marriages godly ascending consecration in makes marriages you're a believer you're a child of god it so happened that you had married before you were born again now you are born again and the husband or maybe the wife is not acting and behaving in a way that makes your life pleasant that makes your life comfortable it's like uh, the man is deliberately punishing and persecuting and opposing you because of your christian faith of the woman is uh, behaving in a way that is not uh, uh, bringing comfort in the home because of your christian stand what are you to do in first corinthians chapter 7 i'm reading here from verse 16 first corinthians chapter 7 verse 16 for what knowest thou O why whether thou shalt save thy husband it says think of eternity and think of how long hellfire will be if you are so close and you're living together and you can be the light of the gospel for him if you leave how does he get born again how does he come to know the lord if the light that is in that home is quenched or is put off or is put away how will that man come to the lord he says be considerate of that whatever you are suffering in that home cannot be compared to what that unbelieving man unbelieving woman will suffer in hell a hundred years ten thousand years a million years trillions of years forever and ever and he says because of the consideration of the salvation of his soul why don't you endure so that your endurance and your prayer and your faith and your christian believers authority will eventually bring him to the lord it says in the other part in the next part of that verse 16 or how knowest thou O man whether thou shalt save thy wife and we're coming to first peter chapter 3 in first peter chapter 3 we're reading from verse 1 First Peter chapter 3, we're looking at verse 1, talking about God using you as an instrument to bring your husband or to bring your wife unto the Lord. It says in First Peter chapter 3, verse 1, likewise, your wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word is not born again if any obey not the word he has not come into regeneration into transformation he has not been converted by the word of god he says that's no reason to say i'm leaving i cannot continue again because the man is showing evidence of total unbeliever is showing evidence of a wicked and cruel unbeliever he says even though he does not obey the word he also they also may without the word without the pastor without a preacher be warned by the conversation the manner of life 
of the wise while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear let's come to point number two now establishing the distinctives for every man this is for everyone that god establishes the standard the institution and the word that is unchanging and the word that we cannot mutilate that we cannot misinterpret that we cannot misapply to come out of whatever challenges or difficulties or persecution we may be facing we're coming to this point number two now and there are three things we're looking at number one divine distribution to every man number two definite duty for every man number three distinct demand for every man you see all this is for every man your new believer this word is for you you are a veteran a believer an old-time believer this is for you you are a christian member or you are a christian minister in the church of the living god the same word belongs to everyone it's for you it's for me it's for those who are enjoying the marriage it's for those who are tolerating the marriage it's for those who are enduring the marriage it's for those who are in any circumstance in their marriage two believers married together and yet they have problem in the flesh they have trouble in the flesh two believers married together but because of the present distress they're going through some challenging times God gives us his word which is established and which cannot be moved and which cannot be changed. It's immutable. We come to number one, divine distribution for every man. We're coming to verse 17 of First Corinthians chapter 7. In First Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17, but as God has distributed to every man, as the Lord has called everyone, so let him walk, and so ordain I in all the churches. What's he saying here? He's saying that some have this gift, other people have another kind of gift, and as God has distributed the gift to everyone, let such a person abide actually the lord jesus christ clears that up when he said in matthew chapter 9 verse 12 matthew chapter 19 rather matthew chapter 19 reading from verse 12 the gift that is given to everyone and he mustn't deceive himself he's not saying i'm not getting married because paul was not married i'm not getting married because uh, so and so was not married i want to live like they live he said you cannot do that everyone has his proper gift look at chapter 19 of matthew and we're reading from verse uh, from verse 12 for there are some eunuchs which was so born from their mother's womb there are those who do not have any urge to be with a woman they do not have any any attraction to any woman it's not of their making they were born like that and so somebody somebody is not going to announce it's not going to say don't follow me this is the way I was born. I'm a eunuch. I don't have any attraction to any woman. Nobody is going to announce that and put himself on the Facebook or anywhere and say, This is the reason I'm not married. But he has his own peculiarity. That's why you cannot follow anyone. And then Jesus said, There are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men. The eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men in those days there were kings gentile kings that will uh, make a man a eunuch so as to serve in their palace and then they'll have not have any urge because they had performed a medical surgical operation that makes them not to have any feeling towards any woman then they can take care 
of the wives of those emperors and those kings but now look at the third part of this it says and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake that's a person like paul the apostle he was a eunuch he wasn't married for the kingdom of heaven's sake but he had that gift he wasn't losing he wasn't being attracted to uh, women privately and then wishing uh, why did i come into this kind of a vow no not at all and then jesus said he that is able to receive it let him receive it those are the people that have their proper gift one way or the other and you abide in that situation number two is a definite duty for every man definite duty for every man in first corinthians chapter 7 reading from verse 18 it says is any man called being circumcised let him not become circumcised is any man anyone called in circumcision in uncircumcision let him not be circumcised here paul the apostle is now talking about a jew or a gentile the jew is circumcised and with that circumcision comes a lot of other things there are things they will eat there are things they will not eat and there are things they will count clean there are things they will count unclean but the point is you're being born again circumcised at heart a real child of god being a new creature that is the real issue and that is the duty of everyone in verse 19 it says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of god it says if you compel yourself i will not marry and you are not keeping the commandments of god and your heart your spirit your soul is not totally yielded to god it says there's no profit in that after all all those things marriage or not marriage circumcised or not circumcised you are in this position or in this uh, position you are of this tribe you have that tribe you have this tradition of this tradition you are following after this denomination or that denomination all the outward expression of religion it says nothing like that matters at all but being a new creature it has been a new creature that is significant that's important circumcision of the flesh will not take anyone to heaven and being a jew will not take anyone to heaven and being uncircumcised being a gentile will not hinder anyone from getting to heaven wants to become born again that's what god is looking at he tells us in galatians chapter 5 galatians chapter 5 reading from verse 6 here he tells us for in jesus christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but faith that walketh by love your marriage faith that walketh by love that's the important thing you are not married faith that walketh by love is what matters if you are copying paul if you are copying another person because they are not married i'm not going to get married and because i read in a particular autobiography that man went here went there that woman was free and was able to do whatever she wanted to do because they were not married i want to take that same vow i want to make that same consecration but you do not have the heart and the spirit and you do not have the disposition of a new creature in christ living sincerely living transparently living without hypocrisy and living without the challenge or the pressure of the flesh then what are you going to give for that it says for in christ jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith 
which walketh by love. It tells us in Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 15. Galatians chapter 6, reading from verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. But a new creature. What's the demand then from every man by the Lord Himself? We're coming to number three there, and that is the distinct uh, demand for every man. First Corinthians chapter seven, verse twenty. First Corinthians chapter seven, reading from verse twenty. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. You are being called as a Gentile. You can remain in Gentile, but be a new creature. You are called as a Jew. You can remain as a Jew, but make sure you are a new creature. You are called in this station of life, in this situation in life. You remain in that situation in life, but make sure that you are a new creature. Make sure you have that righteousness of faith. You have repented. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as, as a result of that, the Lord himself has taken away your sin. And the Lord has changed your life. And there is the regeneration of the spirit. Abide in the outward calling. But make sure that you are real. You are a real child of God. The calling he has given us is a calling to righteousness. A calling to salvation. A calling to holiness. In First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 7. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Reading from verse 7. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Are you married? He has called us unto holiness. Are you not married? If that situation of not being married is leading you, is tempting you, and is plunging you into unrighteousness, then you are not in the will of God. Going about and bragging, I'm not married, and I'm this number of years, I'm not married, and I have this profession, I have this profession. If you are not married and you are not holy, you are not married, you are not sanctified. You are not married in the private. You are not living a righteous life. There's nothing to, be, to brag about. You'll be of all men the most miserable when the Lord will reveal the life of everyone. For God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness that's the calling the lord has given us and i pray that his grace whether you are married or not married whether you are young or you are old whether you are in a pleasant marriage or unpleasant marriage i pray this holiness without which no man shall save the lord will be the lord of everyone in jesus name we're coming to point number three now, exemplifying the devotion of his members. It will come to First Corinthians chapter 7, and we're reading from verse 21. First Corinthians chapter 7, we're reading from verse 21. It says, Art thou called being a servant? Care not for it, for if thou may, but if thou mayest be free, made free you see it rather it says don't worry about you know i'm a servant i'm a master i'm a free man i'm a bunch man i'm looked upon and they look highly to me or they look down on me it says all those stations in life will not matter when the lord shall come for he that is called in the lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise, also he that is called being a, being free is the Lord's is Christ's servant. You know what he's saying? He's saying there are two categories of people. You see, in those days there were slaves and there were masters, and those slaves were called servants of men, and the masters were called free men. The masters had liberty. 
they could go here and there they could command any sinner and they lived in freedom they were not under the bondage of the law unto any man but in the case of servants they were slaves and they were under oppression but Paul the Apostle reminded the people by inspiration of the Spirit of God he says if you are a servant of man but you are born again now you are a free man in Christ a free woman in Christ he says if you are free like a master and you become born again you become a servant of Christ so he says everything balances of servant you are free in Christ you are a master you are free you are servant of Christ and then he tells us in verse 22 for he that is called in the Lord being a servant if the Lord's free man likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant and then in verse 23 ye are bought with a price he says that's what matters are you a slave you are bought with a price are you a master you are bought with a price are you a Jew you are bought with a price are you a gentile if you are bought with a price are you married but then there's persecution inside that marriage he says don't look at that the glorious fact is that you are bought with a price be not the servants of men brethren let every man wherein he is called therein abide with god it tells us number one the privilege of becoming the lord's free man whatever you are whoever you are whatever your situation in life young or old the joy is that the lord has picked you up and instead of being a servant to sin instead of being a slave to satan instead of being a slave a servant to evil spirits the lord has set you free and whom the son sets free is free indeed he says that is our privilege and that is our joy it tells us in romans chapter 6 reading from verse 18 romans chapter 6 reading from verse 18 the lord's free man the one that is set free by the power of the lord and it says in romans chapter 6 verse 18 being then made free from sin you became the servants of righteousness and in verse 22 being now be, now being made free from sin and become servants to god ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life he says that's our joy we're made free in the lord and whatever oppression whatever persecution whatever servanthood whatever subjection may be there in the world look at the joy of being free in the lord and then we're set free unto life eternal that when the lord shall come he will take us home and then you will enjoy total freedom complete freedom forever and ever and yours will be the glory of the glories of heaven in jesus name number two is the price of purchasing the lord's free men what's the price that has purchased us he says always think about that how precious you are in the sight of the lord marriage or not married persecuted or not persecuted having total freedom or you don't have total freedom in the things of the world the joy that god counts you precious precious enough to set the lord jesus christ on your behalf precious enough to save you from a life of sinning precious enough to write your name in the book of life in heaven it tells us in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 23 you are bought with a price you are bought with a price it says nobody goes to the market to go and buy something of no value 
if your master is treating you like a slave as if you are of no value you are not important and you don't have any commercial value and it can toss you here and there he says don't think about that don't look at that he's a human being he doesn't understand but god has put a price on you and he has sent his only begotten son and with the blood of that lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world with that blood you are cleansed with that blood you are bought with that blood you are purchased he says rejoice in that he says you are bought with a price be not ye the servants of men that is don't let anybody compel you into occultism don't let anybody compel you in their darkness don't let anybody compel you and because of food and because of shelter and because of provision and because of money and because of material things promise you this or even threaten you if you don't submit if you don't succumb this is what we're going to withdraw from you it says do not voluntarily give yourself as a slave as a servant of a man of a sinner of anybody of a bully that will want to control your life remember you are bought with a price he had emphasized that in chapter 6 first corinthians chapter 6 we're reading from verse 19 it says what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost your body is the temple of the holy ghost there may be masters there may be men there may be women that will look down on you because of the value he puts on your body according to him you are not this you are not that and he doesn't respect your knowledge doesn't respect your vision does not even respect any physical features that you have he says but please understand you are so precious to the lord that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you and which ye have of god and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are gods we are bought with a price and we know we're precious in the sight of the lord and we carry ourselves we behave ourselves with that understanding how precious we are before the lord number three there is perseverance of abiding as the lord's free man he set you free he set me free and now we persevere and we abide as the lord's free man that's why he tells us in first corinthians chapter 7 verse 24 brethren let every man wherein is called therein abide with god he calls me calls you a new creature abide a new creature he calls you a steward of the mysteries of the kingdom of god abide a steward he calls you a servant of christ a servant of god abide as a servant of christ as a servant of god he calls you a joint heir with christ a co-heir with christ that's the calling he has given you abide in that he calls you that you will have part in the rapture and when he comes great will be your joy abide in that and abide and dear unto the very end look at first john chapter 2 verse 24 first john chapter 2 verse 24 he wants us to abide abide until he comes it's called us children of god it's called us into the kingdom abide it says in chapter 2 first john verse 24 let that therefore abide in you which ye have which ye have heard from the beginning the word the doctrine the teaching the message we've heard from the beginning 
let that abide in you before you got married you heard the message of marriage you heard about marriage being the institution of god and you, you heard what god has joined together let no man put asunder let no misinterpretation put asunder let no hardness of heart put asunder let no tradition put asunder and let nothing inner man or woman or theologian put asunder abide in that word which you heard from the beginning if that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain shall abide in you ye also shall continue in the son and in the father if the word you heard from the beginning all you have all you have learned from the beginning before your marriage now you are into the marriage and you're having some challenges and you do not allow those challenges to sway you and to take the word of god away from you then you'll abide in the son as well as in the father in verse 28 now little children abide in him abide in him abide in his word abide in the doctrine abide in his revelation it says abide in him that when it shall appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming all the problems we have the present predicament and the present distress and the present difficulties and the present persecution all that is temporary but the lord will soon come and when he comes the people that remain and abide unto the end they'll have joy they'll not be ashamed at his coming i pray you'll not be ashamed when the lord shall come he'll find you abiding and all through your life he'll find you abiding and when th when things are hard when things are tough when the difficulties are there go back to the cross go back to the lord he is your savior he is your shepherd the thief cometh not but to, to steal and to kill and to destroy i am come that they might have life that they might have it more abundantly whatever problem we have god is the solution to our problem and the solution will come in jesus name even tonight as you present any problem to the lord problem of singleness of being single problem of being married and then there is uh, not uh, all that you're expecting in the marriage or there are problems of persecution or challenges in the marriage now unto him uh, that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or seek according to the power that worketh in us unto him be glory forever and ever in jesus name you will have glory in your marriage you'll have glory in your personal life all those problems bring to the lord if you have faith and doubt not you will say to this mountain be thou removed it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you abundant life is before you and the joy peace and satisfaction fulfillment is before you ask it shall be given unto you seek and you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you every good thing you ask for for your personal life for your marital life for your family life the lord will grant unto you in jesus name i said the lord will grant to you in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer and we rejoice because of the word and we accept the revelation of the word of god and that revelation that he has given us whatever is happening hardness of heart in some people or the tradition of men among some people or misinterpretation among some people or childlessness among some people or the present district present the predicament 
or present a pandemic among some people or it is because of trouble in the flesh whatever it is look up to the lord or it is persecution the lord will answer your prayer he'll make your marriage what it ought to be in jesus name once again you'll wipe away all your tears you'll enjoy the gift of the family life he has given to you in jesus name that the people of god said amen. amen open your mouth now and talk to the lord in prayer